Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's live-streamed program with the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Gloria Duffy, President and CEO of the club and our chair for today's program. I'm very pleased to welcome our guests, Ayan Hersi Ali and Barry Weiss. Ms. Ali is a research fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and author of the new book, Prey, Immigration, Islam, and the Erosion of Women's Rights. In this, her third book, she examines police and immigration data to consider the sources of increased sexual violence against women in Europe. She makes a number of recommendations about improving asylum and immigration policies and better integrating new migrants into host country societies. Ms. Ali is the recipient of more than 20 prizes for her writing, public service, and human rights advocacy, including the Simone de Beauvoir Prize and the Goldwater Award, and she's one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. Joining Ms. Ali in conversation this evening is Barry Weiss, a journalist, most recently of the New York Times, and author of the best-selling book, How to Fight Anti-Semitism. After their initial conversation, I will be asking Ms. Ali and Ms. Weiss your questions. Please write your questions in the text chat area on YouTube, and we'll get to them later in the program. Now, I'm very pleased to welcome Ayan Hersi Ali and Barry Weiss, and I'll return later for the question program. Thank you so much, Dr. Duffy. Imagining that if you're in this conversation that you might have seen some of the noise um, surrounding tonight's event. And I guess I wanna speak briefly before we get into the conversation about that controversy and speak directly to all of you. We live in a world in which we insist that women are to be believed, that their lived experiences should be trusted. And yet those same people want to silence Ion for sharing hers, never mind that she has survived the most evil forms of violence against women imaginable. We live in a moment in which we declare that Black Lives Matter, yet Ion is a Black woman who has traveled under armed guard for more than a decade and a half due to credible death threats. And she is now being told that her mere voice puts people's lives in danger. We live in a world in which we are told that some speech is violence, and yet sounding the alarm on actual violence perpetrated against women and girls is met with accusation and denunciation. This isn't just hypocrisy. These are the tools that illiberal ideologues who masquerade in morally fashionable language use to bully and silence those that they disagree with. Those who want to shut down conversation aren't interested in speech or freedom or safety. They're interested in power. But thankfully, we still live in a country with a Bill of Rights and a constitution and a culture of liberalism where we get together on forums like this and freely discuss hard subjects with respect and with decency. Those are the principles of the open society and they are worth fighting for. And I want to sincerely thank the Commonwealth Club and Dr. Duffy for their refusal to capitulate to this censoriousness and deeply un-American mob that tried to get this event canceled. And with that, let's get to the reason that you are all here, which is Ayan Hirsi Ali and her new book, which is called Prey, Immigration, Islam, and the Erosion of Women's Rights. So Ayan, as always, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I want to start with something that you write early on in your book. You write early on that it's one of the rich ironies of early 21st century history that a single decision that has done the most harm to European women in my lifetime was made by a woman. I wonder if you can talk about who that woman is and what her decision is, her decision was, and how it informs what you write about in these pages in your new book. Barry, thank you very much for that fantastic introduction. I also, uh, like you, want to thank the Commonwealth, Cla- uh, the Commonwealth Club uh, for hosting me and you and um, for refusing to capitulate 
to the mob. I also wanted to thank especially Dr. Gloria Duffy um, for insisting that this event take place. Uh, Dr. Duffy, thank you very much for your courage. Um, Barry, the feeling is entirely mutual. You are one of my heroes and I think really um, one of the most courageous voices uh, in, who defend freedom in your generation. Now, when it comes to the question that you asked, who is that woman? That is Angela Merkel, Chancellor Angela Merkel. And what is the rich irony? The rich irony is that she, in a moment of thoughtlessness in 2015, decided that it was time to open the gates to immigrants from Syria at that point. That was the question. Um, the, the, the context was a young woman um, cried and the cameras were on and she said, well, what am I going to do? And at first, uh, Mrs. Merkel, or Chancellor Merkel acted like the leader she was saying, you know, I have to think about this sort of thing. You know, we can't accept everyone. Uh, but the child cried and the cameras were on her. And then she said, okay, everyone is welcome. Uh, in that moment of compassion, once large numbers of people came in, and when I say people, these are people who are dispossessed, these are people who are running away from civil war, and they're people who've been exposed to the worst kinds of violence imaginable. But a lot of them were also young men. And so Germany and other parts of Europe were not prepared for that kind of influx, but they too were not prepared for the context that they came into. And I think if that event was handled more thoughtfully, things would have been different today. What would, um, not to jump ahead of ourselves, but what would more thoughtfully have, have looked like in your estimation? In my estimation, I think leaders like Angela Merkel and others, um, you know, the prime minister of the United Kingdom, the president of France, other leaders uh, who were struggling in their countries with the process of integrating in the United States of America, we call it assimilation, who are struggling with the assimilation process of immigrants from Muslim majority countries would have anticipated, especially after such events as the Arab Spring. And before that, that you know, countries in Africa, in South Asia, in the Middle East, that things were churning around and that there would be a huge influx of immigrants and that they would come to Europe sooner or later. I think they should have anticipated these events. Even to this day, I don't think they're having those conversations. So true, what true leadership looks like is to say, we're seeing events, we're having difficulties today on the ground, in this context, it is the failure of assimilation. Five years from now, 10 years from now, what would things look like? But then if that moment arrives and you're overwhelmed and you have all the cameras gazing at you, in other words, the eyes of the world, and you want to look good and compassionate and you make a thoughtless decision, what then happens is it starts to affect other people. And now they're having probably the greatest social volatility and political volatility that Europe has known since the Cold War. So I will out myself as one of those bleeding hearts who cheered in my heart when Angela Merkel made that decision and famously said, we will manage. And maybe like a lot of people watching this event tonight, you know, I think about the refugee crisis in Europe and I think about a little boy, remember the Alan Kurdi in the red t-shirt who washed up on the beaches famously. Um, you write in your book, just to give people a little bit of context uh, for, for the, no the amount of numbers you're talking about. Since 2009, you write in your book, more than 3 million people have arrived illegally in Europe. Um, 
more than two thirds of those immigrants are men, and most of the and the overwhelming majority of them are coming from countries where men and women, not just culturally but according to the law, are not equal. And and that's really the subject of your book is how to square um, the understandable compassion I would say that a lot of us felt and the sympathy for people fleeing countries like Syria with the ideas that people bring with themselves when they cross over the border. So take us a little bit more deeply into the book. Um, the subject of your book, the, the subtitle is the, the Erosion of Women's Rights. Tell us about how this influx of immigrants in your view has changed um, the lives of women and girls, both Muslim inside these communities and also um, non-Muslim in, in cities like Paris and Amsterdam and Berlin. So I will start with the component of compassion. Please. I think we should, absolutely, yeah, totally. That's where we should start. Uh, the You call it a bleeding heart. I just think of it as pure compassion, human to human. I think what's going on in parts of Africa, parts of the Middle East, parts of South Asia uh, and beyond, even right now in China, with the Uyghur community who are being subjected to the greatest violations of human rights, I would just simply call that genocide. And my heart goes out to them. I feel compassion for them. If you are a world leader and um, it is your job, you've been elected um, to express judgment to take the time to make the trade-offs between what is possible, what is attainable. How do you, um, how do you um, turn that compassion into a win-win, not a zero-sum game, but into a win-win uh, outcome? What would you do? That requires a lot of thought. It requires a lot of hard work. It requires the convening of a lot of world leaders, it, it requires you to compel others to say, this is a burden worth bearing, and let's share that burden when it comes to resources, when it comes to uh, who are we going to allow in, but what are we going to do in the countries of origin in terms of stabilizing them politically, militarily, economically. That's not the conversations that the European leaders, the world leaders, the Western leaders, the rich countries were having. The conversations they were having in the past decade and a half, two decades, maybe even further, was, you know, I'm going to go after my own self-interest. You go after your own self-interest. People move around, wars take place, economic disruptions and so on, and somebody gets hurt in the process. And the subject of prey is, as these large numbers of people move from poor, unstable countries into supposedly rich countries, somebody gets hurt. And at first, it was immigrant women that were brought in and who were subjected to such things as female genital mutilation, child marriage, and so on. But today, there are neighborhoods with labels such as working class or low income or, or social housing. They've got all sorts of euphemisms to say, these are the lower class incomes, um, lower class communities. They are bearing the burden of the unintended consequences of migration and the leaders, the Angela Merkels of this world are standing in front of the cameras and virtue signaling that, look, we've shown a sense of compassion. We've let everyone in, you've let everyone in. But when, when things get disrupted, when, you, when people's lives get disrupted, who is bearing that burden and what are we doing about that? Well, I think your book would argue that um it's not just immigrant women inside these communities, it's it's all women and girls in these surrounding societies who are pulling themselves back um, from the public square. And so even though 
the laws haven't changed in a lot of these countries, you seem to be making the case that the cultural shift is so tremendous that the law is sort of neutered in the face of it. So maybe, Ion, you can tell us some, give us a little bit of color, give us some examples. One that comes to mind for me is what happened, I think it was New Year's Eve in Cologne in 2015. Um, tell us what happened that night and give us a few examples so that people who haven't read the book have a sense of the extent of what you mean when you talk about the erosion of women's rights, because you're not just talking about catcalling or groping in public, although that happens too. Well, Barry, with with your permission, I'll give you some color. I will read a passage uh, from the book. Um, it is an incident, an infamous incident, um, that I think a lot of people in the audience are familiar with, but that they may have forgotten. Okay. And here goes. This is um, page 64 of Prey. A reckoning came in the German city of Cologne on New Year's Eve, December 31, 2015. Around 1,500 men, mostly newly arrived asylum seekers of Arab and North African backgrounds, converged in the area between Cologne Central Station and the city's famed Gothic cathedral to see in the new year on what Germans call Silvesternacht after the fourth century Pope Saint Sylvester. The men were drunk and ruly and as soon became clear beyond the control of the city's police. They mobbed together to entrap women in the square sexually harassing and assaulting any they could get their hands on, often stealing their wallets and mobile phones in the process. In the following months, 661 women reported being victims of sexual attacks that night. Alice Schwarzer, one of Germany's leading feminists and a Cologne local, investigated the events of that evening, interviewing many of the women who had been attacked. They described being separated from their husbands and male friends and pushed inside hell circles of young migrant men. The men groped women and girls, no matter their age, appearance or circumstances, grabbing their breasts and between their legs. One woman described several men trying to insert their fingers into her vagina. The only thing blocking them was the thick winter tights she was wearing. Some women were held by swarms of men for 30 minutes of continual assault. When they were eventually spat out of the crowd, some reported, and here's what kills me, the police had deliberately looked away. Many women reported ongoing trauma and fear many months after the event. Yet, those who have spoken about what happened to them in public forums have been labeled racist for pointing out the ethnicity or migration status of their perpetrators and now often use pseudonyms when speaking about their experiences. That's the color. Statistics won't tell you that or those experiences. That is failed leadership. And when as a leader, you stand there and you say, I have shown compassion. In fact, you have not. You have shown incompetence. Ayan, in that specific instance that has resonated with me. I've thought about it a lot since I read the book. The thing that disturbed me the most is that the police said that the event was largely peaceful. And, and that's a theme that kind of repeats itself throughout the book. Two years later in another German city in Berlin, also on New Year's Eve, you write about an incident um, or a kind of a party, a gathering for New Year's Eve in an area near the Brandenburg Gate. And you write about how the police specifically set up an area, a women's safety area. And the police spokesman wasn't ashamed to say publicly, this is a good opportunity to offer women a place to feel, to retreat to if they feel harassed. What is going on here? 
Why is our police and law enforcement, to say nothing of the leadership you've talked about, failing at their most basic duties, which is to provide public safety for people? That, so that is the question, really. The subtext of the book it, it, it is this failed leadership. It is uh, the question that I ask myself. Why were we surprised by the events of 2015 and beyond when, in fact, we had seen the, some of these things happen in various countries in the past decades at a smaller scale. So we could have seen it happening. But we had seen this happen in Egypt. We had seen it happen in Syria, in various Arab countries. It's called Taharush. It's called the rape game. And so we knew that if we had allowed a large number of men, very young men, um, to come in, you know, unguided, not socialized into the new context that they were coming into, um, that we were going to run into problems like this one. And then the response itself, where the onus, uh, the burden of putting up with this is put on the women and it's put on women in poor neighborhoods. Uh, and I think that that is, it, it really is just, it, it's outrageous. It's absolutely outrageous. So, so if you want more color, as you read the book, you will see example after example. I've spoken to so many women who say, they literally say, I'm not anti-migrant. I want, they want to display the exact same compassion that Angela Merkel displayed. They feel sorry for the people of Syria. They feel sorry for the people of, of Afghanistan. They feel sorry for the people of Somalia and elsewhere. They want to welcome them. There are so many volunteers in so many of these European countries who want to do good things for people in difficult places. Most of them vote center-left parties, mm -hmm. but they also describe how the streets have changed, how the schools have changed the continuous assault on their bodies, the obscenities that are, uh, how they're assailed on a daily basis and how the authorities leave them to themselves because when they go to the city council to say, look at what's happening in my neighborhood, they're just dismissed as xenophobes and racists. And that is where the radical right come in. That is where the Russian trolls come in. That's where the radical Islamists come in and all other fringe groups and extremists with an agenda because the mainstream parties don't want to deal with these issues. Right. So you make a really powerful argument in the book that because the center left, even the center, um, is so scared to touch this issue that it basically gets exploited by the populist right that says, aha, look at these horrible things that are happening um, and use it to make arguments for mass deportation and things like that. Is that one of the reasons that you felt the need to write this book? And I would love for you to speak to critics who claim that even by writing a book like this and shedding light on this topic, that you're somehow offering fodder um, to right-wing nationalists, for example. I think when, if you said that you were offering fodder to right-wing nationalists and nutcases 20 years ago, that was excusable because, you know, that made sense. You thought that's what these, that's what feeds these extremists. But over time, we have seen that when mainstream parties and when mainstream leaders silence everyone and everything and put this taboo and just say, oh, you're xenophobic, you're full of hate speech, you know, and there's this censorship around these topics. It's these extremists who benefit and benefit largely. And sometimes they go from, you know, they come out of nowhere and just occupy, uh, take occupation of relatively large fractions of parliaments. Now, if you look at this book, it, it, it zooms in on women and how they're being elbowed out of certain neighborhoods and other public spaces, cafes, transport systems, etc., and how they're trying to cope and adapt to these circumstances. But it's not just women. 
you could go to Europe and you could talk to Jewish minorities and they would tell you the same thing. They would say, we've lived here for centuries and we've suffered and today we can't anymore. John, uh, um, Jonathan Goldberg of the Atlantic, he did a piece in France on what was happening to Jewish minorities. 2014, I think. Jeff, yeah. I think it was 2014, yeah. And he did a similar sort of, uh, uh, you know, journey, uh, uh, similar analysis where he talked to a lot of Jewish leaders who were saying, we lived here all our, all our lives. These changes are taking place because of immigration, especially from Muslim countries. And now we're being faced with Islamist driven anti-Semitism, but not only that, the old extreme right wing anti-Semitism is coming out of the cracks now because it's become okay to be anti-Semitic. And they were responding by leaving their neighborhoods if they could, by leaving to go to Israel or to come to America or not to look Jewish, which is what the women are doing they are covering themselves so as not to look desirable or attract male attention. You could do the exact same um, portrait of what is going on when it comes to homosexuals. They are doing, they're not holding hands, they're not looking gay because they're being attacked. And why is that happening? Because there are immigrants who are coming from countries where there is intolerance towards homosexuality. And when they see it, they don't just feel hostile, they act on that hostility. And when it happens over and over and over again in your neighborhood, people want to feel safe, they're scared. And so they start to delete themselves, they erase themselves out of their neighborhoods, cafes, you know, and there's more fear and there's more silence. So it's not just women is what I want to say. So that, I guess, leads me to a question I've been thinking about a lot and not just in the context of your book, but I think more generally in the West right now, which is I've wanted to ask you if you feel that intersectionality, multiculturalism, cultural and moral relativism, the idea that all cultures are created equal, um, have they trumped um, the old notion of what I've been raised to think of as feminism or, or women's rights? I think if you are a feminist and you knew about the subject of prey, you would be raising more than holy hell. Um, the question is, do they know or do they want to know? Mm -hmm. Now, me Too was very interesting. I thought it was inspiring because there were powerful men who were taking advantage of their positions on women in the working place. And for women to come out against that and say, this happened to me, and this happened to me, and that conduct has to stop, that was a good thing. But it came to a screeching halt. It didn't get to the women that I discuss in prayer that is working class women. So right now, there is no feminism that is defending working class women, number one. Number two, yes, there is another kind of feminism, which I'm not, I don't object to it, but I wish it would become a bigger tent. It is the feminism that's been about you know, shattering the glass ceiling. We want women CEOs, we want women presidents, we want women chancellors, we want women. I think that's all fine. But right now, you know what I want? I want a feminism that goes to discuss and start an activism to say, don't touch us in the public space. Don't grope us. We don't want to hear those lewd noises. We don't want to be raped. We don't want to be gang raped. And I don't care what our income is. And I don't care if we're immigrant women or white women. I don't care if we're working class or what the heck. And I don't give two hoots about who the perpetrator is. A rapist is a rapist. And I don't care if he's a rich white man. And I don't care if he is a poor 
Syrian refugee. A rapist is a rapist. You can explain it, but you can't excuse it. We need that kind of feminism. And I am compassionate enough, and I know you are, Barry, and happy to socialize these young men who are fleeing violence. I'm not arguing for these men to be punished in ways that are disproportionate. I would love them to be socialized. Let's get going with those programs of socializing them, of civilizing them. So are there, are there programs in particular countries that you would point to as um, you know, places that you see for growth, optimistic, like tell us about who's doing integration or assimilation, whatever you, word you want to use right. Now that you have these 3 million people in Europe, they're not going anywhere. Give right. us examples of countries that are, or cities or towns even that are doing it right. Um, and if you were uh, the head of the European Union, what you would be doing starting tomorrow? Uh, so two different questions. One is, are there countries or leaders of countries that are doing the right thing? I think, yes, there are leaders in countries such as Denmark, Austria, and recently, quite recently, the president of France, who are rejecting this whole concept of multiculturalism, intersectionality, cancel culture. Um, they're rejecting that whole umbrella of ideas or ideology, and they're saying, wait a second, um, not all cultures are created equal. Some cultures are better than others, and our cultures of freedom and equality are better, and they're insisting on integration programs, and they're implementing those. They're making the resources available, and they have that carrot and stick approach. You're welcome. We'll give you all the resources that you need to integrate or assimilate. If you fail to do that, then you have to think about the consequences and live with those consequences. And I've seen that that, that actually is working. Now, that also comes with an idea that's been declared taboo, which is think about national identity and borders. And because if you say to someone, if you want to be in this country, then you have to abide by the laws and the values and the norms of this country. If you refuse to do that, you'll be, uh, you'll be evicted, you'll be removed from this country. For that to make sense, you do have to have borders. So that conversation is coming back. The second part of um, the question, if I were, what did you say, commissioner of the EU, I would yeah, say- or, or, you know, head of one of the countries, what would you do? I want to, I want to hear some solutions. Well, I think being uh, head of the commission of the EU is a different position because you're able to convene all of these countries where then you can collectively do things together. And that takes us then to the big picture. And the big picture is things are happening in Africa. Things are happening in the Middle East. Things are happening in, and uh, the European countries really checked out of that scenario. You know, when things go bad, the United States of America takes care of it. That whole approach of Uncle Sam, you know, does it for us. And we'll just retreat into our own little chateaus and drink our fine wine uh, until, uh, you know, some kind, some president knocks the door and says, come on. We need an alliance to join us here, there, everywhere. And I think they need to be told, listen, it is in your backyard that all this instability is happening. And if you don't do something about it, you are the one who is going to be affected. And this is exactly what immigra immigration or migration or rather the, the movement of hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, that is what is happening in Europe. So being the commissioner, of the EU means you convene all of these countries, the leaders of these countries, and you start thinking in those terms, how, what can you do to stabilize the economies of these countries, talk about the politics of those countries so that people don't feel compelled to cross and actually take these very dangerous journeys uh, to make their way to Europe. What do you say to women, and you've interviewed so many from this book, some of whom are um, 
bravely speaking out on the issues you're talking about, but a lot of whom are sort of closeted about it because, frankly, for totally understandable reasons. What do you say to women who are scared to speak out about this issue because they're understandably nervous about being smeared, being called the things that you're called regularly, um, I'm sure at this very moment <laughs> on social media. And, you know, for you, it's not just social media, it's it's real life. So I'm wondering how you advise them and and what, what advice you give to those maybe who are watching this, um, who want to speak out on this issue, but are, but are scared to. I would say stand together like you and I have done today and yesterday and in the past few weeks, uh, you have been smeared and you've had, you've been bullied out of your job. Um, and you've had to face a great deal of pain, uh, but it's made you stronger. It's made me stronger. And I think this is the message. It's like, let's find all those women and let's stand together. And let's not the, make the mistake that many of my fellow feminists make, which is, well, I'm out of that, you know, pain and problems. Now I'm going to forget all about the other girls. I'll, when I say this again, I'll give you a bit of color. I looked into the issue of the grooming gangs um, and what's happening in the UK. And I asked myself, why, why were those children betrayed? Why for so many years, didn't, why didn't people do anything? Not just the authorities, but other women, you know, mothers, why didn't they do anything? And there's one phrase that I find so painful that I heard over and over and over again. The victims of the Pakistani grooming gangs were dismissed as white trash. Just think about that, white trash. These are fellow human beings, these are children, and that's how they were dismissed. So if we think of fellow girls and fellow human beings as either white trash or black trash, and we give people those sorts of labels, then feminism is not worth its name. Ayan, go deep for me on this. Like, wh what is at the root of the inability beyond just lack of courage? Is it like a crisis? And I, I think maybe this is beyond just this issue, a crisis in confidence in Western culture, in Western civilization. What What's at the root of what's going on here that explains so many people at every level's inability to stand up for what I think is obviously kind of the most basic human rights? Um, so it's not everyone. There are a lot of people who are standing up and who are fighting. You are aware you're in those circles where people are saying, well, enough is enough now. But yeah, there is a great deal of fear uh, where in, let me just zoom in on the cancel culture. It is, you have to make a choice between, you know, you fear for your livelihood, you fear for your, if you're paying a mortgage, if you're paying, um, fees, college fees for your kids, um, if you want to be invited to all sorts of things for your colleagues and your neighborhoods, you don't want to come out and be at the spoil spot, um, the rubble rouser. And so I think between fears that have to do with, um, you know, being socially ostracized or economic consequences um, and sometimes even physical fear. Um, this is what I've endured and still do and others do. I think if you if you combine all of this, um, there is a sense that it is rational perhaps not to, maybe someone else should do it. And if I think someone else should, should do it and you think someone else should do it, and we all think someone else should do it, then no one does it. And uh, uh, besides that, yes, there's also uh, undoubtedly a crisis of confidence uh, because there's this demand that we in the Western civilization atone for what happened in the past. And that is a good thing. It's a good thing to reflect on the past and to grapple with it and to use the past 
as a lesson to improve things in the present and the future. But if you only tell a selective story, um, then then you're not really truly grappling with the past. And the story that we hear over and over and over again is that we just did terrible things. We enslaved, we committed genocides, we colonized peoples. And you hear that drummed into you day in, day out, all of it true. But what about all the good stuff we did? And that, you know, kids aren't told that these days. And so the conclusion is either just a complete trauma when it comes to national identity, when it comes to, you know, how should I as a young person regard the institutions that we have and that we have inherited when they have committed so many sins and they've done so many bad things. If the conclusion is, as Black Lives Matter says, let's rip everything apart, let's destroy the whole thing, that also doesn't resonate. So I think a lot of it leads to either apathy or the kind of activism that you and I are against or the kind of leadership that we were talking about who can only just, they can either virtue signal or just avoid avoid sensitive issues, issues that have to do with issues of our day. You're someone, though, that has endured every name. Every single time I've met you in real life, you've had armed guard. um, And that's been true following the murder of uh, Theo Van Gogh. And I guess I'm, you know, for the hundreds of people or maybe more that are watching this, I'm wondering if you can give people a little bit of your courage or a little bit of a sense of what drives you and how you articulate to yourself what's at stake that allows you to keep making that choice over and over again at great cost, not just to your, your name, um, but to your, your physical safety and your ability to move around the world freely. Um, I'm wondering if you can offer that message to people and then I'll take you to one more question before we bring back Dr. Duffy. Well, Barry, uh, so much has been given to me again. Like I said, if I decide to just wallow in what went wrong with my life, um, then I will take a, a wrong turn. Um, I will live a life of bitterness and anger and resentment. But if I reflect on all the kindnesses, the grace that I receive, the generosity that people have given me, the friendship, the love, in every step of the way, then I can't let those people down. I have to give that. I also have to give that back. I have to give it to my children. I have to give it to my husband. I have to give it to my friends, but also to the people that I talk about in Pray and in other books. Um, it, It makes me very, very, very upset to hear phrases like white trash or to see a child bride, or to hear the scream of another child being mutilated and to say nothing. I know I can, and I would choose to say something because someone said something for me. Someone held my hand, someone pulled me up and they never wanted anything in return. They just wanted me once I got on my own feet to do it for someone under those circumstances. Hi, and I wanted to relay a little story for you that struck me. Um, I like to think of this in my own life as the Ion Hersia Lee litmus test, which is I basically know where someone falls on key issues depending on what they think of you. But I was um, recently met the actress Amber Heard and she had something which she referred to as the eye on her CLE challenge, which is in every single interview she gives with every single women's magazine, she's asked who her hero is or who her favorite author is. And she always says you every single time. Now the challenge is to see if anyone will ever print it. And until now, and this was like two weeks ago, no one has ever printed your name uh, in response to that question. And to me, um, I would simply say, first of all, I wanted to give her a shout out um, because she's a very, very big fan of yours. But to me, that speaks to exactly what you talked about earlier, which is 
We need a feminist movement in America, in the West, and around the world um, that does more than s simply stand up for people that are famous, mm -hmm. um, that looks out for the kind of people that you write about and pray, and that has you in the pantheon of feminist heroes as you rightly should be. So um, I had to relay that. Um, and with that, I think we want to bring back in uh, Dr. Duffy. Thank you so much. I hope I'm heard and seen. Uh, and I want to thank you both for a great conversation. I also want to just comment on your kind words at the beginning of the event. Uh, and I want to say that we at the Commonwealth Club understand the sensitivities in our community, especially after what we've been through as a country over the last few months. And so uh, we're 118 years old here at the Commonwealth Club, and we've been having respectful dialogue uh, all of that time. And we are convinced that that's possible and we're committed to it. And I'm, we are having such a dialogue tonight and uh, we're delighted that we can talk about the toughest of subjects with, with great mutual respect. So thank you, everybody, audience and, panel and uh, speakers. We do have quite a few um, uh, questions. Uh, some of them have to do with the relevance of this discussion about immigration and integration to, to the U.S. And there's so much in your book, uh, Ayan. Uh, you discuss how integration worked better. Uh, there were large influxes of immigrants into the U.S. Uh, starting in the mid 19th century and into the early 20th century, especially different groups from different parts of the country. What conclusions do you draw from the U.S. example about how large waves of immigrants can be accommodated and become uh, functioning members of a new society? I think in the um, Gloria, thank you once again for those kind words. And again, you know, kudos to the Commonwealth Club. Um, in the in the periods that you describe, um, immigration to the United Nations, sorry, to the United Nations, <laughs> yeah, it's become a United Nations. Immigration to the United States was selective. It was selective first because only the fittest and the strongest and those who could withstand that crazy journey across the Atlantic were able to, to do it. And once they made it, I mean, can you imagine going back? They, they, had, to, they had to adapt. They had no choice but to adapt and it was adapt or die and many died. And as wave after wave came, um, that um, that selection continued um, and it became more formalized. Um, and I read about, you know, the Ellis Island, um, this is um, late 19th century, early 20th century, where um, those large, large, large cruises were coming, ships um, that are now holiday ships, but back then were bringing these people in and my gosh, they had to meet so many criteria. And once they came, they had to pass through so many hoops. And if they failed to do that, they were returned. Um, that's not, and that is why I think what is happening in Europe, to call that immigration is a complete uh, misnomer. It, it, it's just, this is, this is just a spontaneous exodus of people who are trying to cross from various continents into a different continent and that kind of selection is not happening the the sort of the natural selection is happening if you can cross the mediterranean uh, and make it to the other side and you're still alive that happens <laughs> you're part of the strongest but when it comes to that you know are you going to fit in? Can you work? What are you going to do? Who's going to pay for you? That sort of thing. Um, that's really not what's happening. And I think that those people who compare why American immigration is a success and why immigration, especially from Muslim countries, is a failure, I think they haven't really looked deep into these differences. 
I really like the latter part of your book where you talk about solutions and uh, really focus on better integration and better support for the immigrant communities. Uh, could you talk in a little more detail, uh, for instance, the type of interviews that are done for asylum, focusing more on how people are suited to adapt to the new country that they're coming into, as opposed to where they came from or how they got there? I think in Europe, uh, we waste a lot of resources on trying to figure out whether you qualify for asylum or not. Um, when in fact it is quite clear. Um, let me give you an example. A country like Syria breaks down, but you are sitting two, three, four hours, sometimes days with a civil servant who is asking you, um, are you the victim of persecution by a government? I mean, you would think, dear civil servant, do you ever read the news? You know, where do you live? How could you possibly be asking these questions? So the questions were designed for people who were fleeing the Cold War. They were on the other side of the wall. And those exact same questions are still in place for situations such as Syria or Afghanistan or Somalia or Eritrea, where people are not saying that they flee that they're personally persecuted by a particular administration um, or that they are holding nuclear secrets uh, that they're all solzhenitsyns that's not the story the story is my entire government broke down it's a man eat man situation we all fled and the strongest of us came here because we were told by family members that if you go to europe there is a chance at starting a new life. And that is the conversation that we should be having. You're welcome to start a new life, but let's see, can you do it? Here are the conditions. And I wish that they would stop demonizing what they call economic migrants, which is what America did not do. Actually, America welcomed and still does and should welcome economic migrants. That is the difference. And so I think there's, there should be a shift, a paradigm shift in the way Europe approaches immigration and do it more the way America does it. And then for the larger group that can't be because it's overwhelming. I mean, the number of people who want to come to Europe are way, way bigger than uh, the number of people that they can actually accommodate. That is then the subject of foreign policy and and not just the foreign policy of one country, that is global policy. Several people in our audience are wondering what the impact of COVID has been. Has it reduced migration? Has it in any <coughs> way improved or affected the lives of women? Um, so those are again, two different questions. The first bit is about migration and COVID has caused, uh, there, are, there were economies that in Africa and in all those places where immigrants are coming from um, that were struggling. And uh, COVID has devastated, devastated those economies. There'll be food shortages. When there are food shortages, there's going to be more conflict. So again, we can now, I can tell you today we, we can anticipate large numbers of people trying to make their way by the summer of this year and by the spring of next year and by the summer of next year, uh, like fleeing conflict and fleeing famine and fleeing drought because of the consequences of COVID. And Europeans should be able to anticipate that and start doing something about it now, now. Not when they all arrive and the cameras are on the leader and say, okay, help, let them in. Um, one person uh, is going back to your comments about policing and the lack of enforcement of protections of women. Um, and the question is, how do you, what do you think about the debate about defunding police or, re or replacing police services with less traditional types of uh, community safety approaches? I think when you say things like defund the police, what you're saying is you want a total breakdown of law and order. 
and where there is a total breakdown of law and order, you get situations like what we've been talking about, Syria, Somalia. In fact, sometimes I get so frustrated. I say, if you don't want to have a police force, go, you know, visit Somalia for some time, live there for a few months, come report back. Um, so defunding the police is a desire, a utopic desire that leads nowhere. It's a, it is a complete breakdown of law and order. Now, an institution like the police can go wrong in some ways. And so instead of the slogan being defund the police, I think it should be reform the police. And to reform the police, then you have to absolutely articulate what it is that the police is doing wrong. And there are so many people who are working at that. In the past few years, we have seen demands for them to carry cameras, to hold them accountable. So much has been done, uh, but the calls to defund the police um, are just, it's just going to lead to anarchy. Well, there are different views about that, and uh, I have mental illness in my family, and one individual who's been in and out of jail all, all her life for things that aren't particularly uh, well addressed by the criminal justice system. So I think there are some people who are thinking about creative alternatives, but we all have our, our views on this, and I certainly respect yours. Um, could you tell Dr. us- Duffy, I think- I think you have a point. Dr. Duffy, I do think you have a point there. I don't think that the police is the institution responsible for taking care of our mentally ill. Uh, there are other institutions. So it is, again, a, a failure of leadership of a different kind. It's not the police who should be dealing with the mentally ill. The police should be doing what the police need to do. But I think the idea of defunding them and getting doing away with the police is not a good idea. Of course. Could you tell us a little bit about your foundation, the Ion Hersey Ali Foundation? What does it do? What has it accomplished? Um, the Ayan Hersey Ali Foundation defends the rights of women and children. And Barry and I were just talking about uh, that who don't have a voice for themselves. So these are victims of female genital mutilation, um, child marriage, forced marriage, honor violence. Uh, what have we achieved? Um, we have lobbied. Um, I'm not sure we're actually allowed to use the word lobby, but we have uh, tried to get through legislation to outlaw female genital mutilation in all states. Uh, we have tried and succeeded in bringing back children who were abducted from the United States of America through the State Department, uh, got them back, and these children were being forced into marriages that they didn't want their children. Um, we have helped prosecute and prosecutors uh, to go after um, uh, perpetrators of honor killings. These are uh, fathers and brothers and other relatives who have murdered their female relatives because they claim that their honors were violated. We train service providers, uh, that is social workers, women, uh, people who work in the domestic violence sector into, uh, we, we, we talk to them about these are specific um, domestic violences that affect these women. Uh, and it's a domestic violence that is justified in the name of culture and religion. And that's what we do. And we do it across the country. And to our audience tonight, uh, please go to ayanhirsiali.org. That is the AHA Foundation. And check it out. Give what you can. <laughs> And uh, has there not been some recent success in the legislation against female genital mutilation at the end of last year, if I recall? Uh, yes, there has. And not only that, that I mean, there, there's also a process that's ongoing that I'm not yet allowed to talk about because it might affect the outcome. One other interesting approach 
um, to immigration, I believe, has been by the Justin Trudeau government in Canada, which is to favor women in immigration, uh, in asylum and immigration, to try to um, redress the balance and uh, add more women to the stream of, of immigrants. Uh, what do you think about a strategy like that? I think it's a great strategy to focus on the vulnerable women, children, um, especially victims of sexual violence. And I can tell you that if you look at um, the, the people fleeing civil war and turmoil, um, there are a lot of women there who have been subjected to the worst kinds of sexual violence and if if they've survived that i would give them a pass i would let them in so it is it's a great um it's a great gesture and, and it's welcome and i'm thankful for that um, so, what about international and global organizations we do have a un high commissioner from for refugees what about the global uh, structure of organizations that are supposed to be helping and protecting migrants and so on what are they doing uh, do they have a role to play in the problems like you've identified they they do have a role to play and they have been playing that role but they're overwhelmed they're un and resourced. And again, I go back to world leaders having to really convene and come up with a plan where they can work with these organizations, uh, United Nations organizations and other NGOs to help people stay in their countries of origins by helping them um, build the institutions that they need to get them to a place of political stability and economic stability so that you don't have these mass exoduses of people that not only come away from unstable countries, but along the way, destabilize uh, every place that they go to. So it, it, that's the big question of our time. So I think we're getting close to the end of our program. And again, thank you both so much. I'd like to ask both of you uh, one last question, which is what brief life-changing advice would you give to a little girl today about her path in life and how to conduct herself? Live your life out loud. You only have one life. Um, and I think the choice to be out and proud about who you are, um, regardless of what other people call you, um, can bring incredible joy and meaning to your life. And joy and meaning and being aligned, even with a small group of people that share your values, is way more important than being invited to sit with the popular girls. That's advice I would give. That's absolutely very wise. And the only thing I can add to is be resilient. Um, when love, true love is given to you by people uh, who, who really mean it, not the popular girls, as Barry said, or the popular boys, uh, but the real thing, accept it. And when you get an opportunity to pass that on, do it. Thank you both for that wise advice to your younger selves, my younger self, and all, all the little girls out there. Our thanks to Ayan Hersia Lee, author of the new book, Pray, Immigration, Islam, and the Erosion of Women's Rights, and Barry Weiss, author of How to Fight Anti-Semitism, for joining us today at the Commonwealth Club. Both books are out. They're available wherever books are sold. Make sure you pick up a copy. To our audience, thank you so much for watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's virtual programming, visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Gloria Duffy, um, uh, grateful for respectful dialogue uh, every day, tonight and every day at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Take good care.